Well, as I have been preparing uh, for CityServe uh, over the past couple of months, uh, I have just been really, you know, just in this whole thing about projects and helping other churches get organized and develop partnerships and helping churches work together. And then last Sunday, uh, Pastor uh, Richard was sharing a message on the, uh, the there's only one way and Jesus is that way. And he shared a scripture that just challenged me concerning all our efforts in serving. And that passage comes out of Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23. And it says, On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we have prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name. We've served people at the washerette in your name. We worked at Birchcrest and Bel Air, Two Springs, all kinds of schools in your name. God, we've, we've worked at the uh, EPS in your name. God, we help families and homes in your name. We've worked at city parks. We've worked with city leaders in your name. And listen to what the scripture says. But I will reply, I never knew you. Oh, do you hear it? It is possible. It is possible that everything we're doing today could be futile. It is possible that the works of our hands, the intents of our hearts, could be futile because we don't get the fact that God wants to know us. So I've been wrestling, and as I've been preparing this message for us today, God has challenged me. And I believe he wants to challenge you. This morning, I, there's a lot of responses you could have to this message. Some, some of you, you could listen to it, and you say, Pastor Hooker, I understand what you're trying to say, but you're just not saying it well. That is definitely possible. Can you pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal to you, even in spite of my shortcomings? I, I just believe God wants you to get this. There's some of you, when you hear this, you're going to say, Lord, that's me. I confess my sin. I ask you to forgive me. You're going to repent here today, and you're going to be set free, and you're going to sense freedom in your new relationship with Jesus as you serve him. Others of you, you're going to say, Lord, you're going to say, Pastor, Lord, that's exactly the way I feel. Finally, I see it in the scriptures. That is me, and you're just going to be able to walk out of here excited about serving because you're going to know that you know him in everything that you do. And then there's a possibility that some of you are going to walk out of here and not hear what God is saying to you about how important your relationship with him is in comparison to the stuff you do. So let's go to the word and let the word inspire us this morning. Psalm 100 verses 1 through 2. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve, serve, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Here we find a psalmist commanding us that God wants us to serve him. And I don't think this is the only scripture. I think there's a lot of scriptures that you can find where God is telling us the word of God is saying, serve the Lord, serve the Lord, serve the Lord. And then not only does it give us the command, it gives us the attitude of our heart with gladness. And I know there's times in my life when I'm serving the Lord that I'm not doing it with gladness. And I'm saying, Lord, help me. Show me what this scripture is. Show me that the, what the psalmist is trying to get me to understand about serving him this morning there's two questions we need to wrestle with concerning serving the Lord if you have your pen pencils you need to write them down if you have your electronic device you need to type it in question number one what is God's motivation in asking you to serve him God what is it what is it what's the motivation of your heart when you ask me to serve you and, and serve others as I serve you what's your motivation Number two, what is my motivation? What is your motivation in our serving? What is our motivation when we serve? I believe today 
we're going to be challenged in our motivation as we learn what God's motivation is. I think we presume some things about God. We assume some things about God that allow us to take attitudes about serving that are not correct. And today we want to address those incorrect assumptions about God and our serving. Matthew 20, 26 through 28. The mom of the sons of Zebedee are coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I want my boys to be sitting on your left and your right. And, and Jesus responds to mom, mom, um, I don't know if I can do that. I really can't do that. That's for the father. But can your boys carry this cup that I'm carrying, this cup of suffering? And the boys said, yes, we can. And Jesus said, you will. You will carry this cup of suffering. But it's not my place. It's not my place to put you on my left and right. That's left to the father. And then he goes on to, to say, to, to help them understand this whole idea about leadership and greatness. And, and he says, the Lord, the, these, these leaders lord it over people. They, they, because of their positions, they lord themselves over people. And, and, and these rulers, they, they have authority over, over people. There's this attitude in the world where, where there's rulers that, that rule over people, and, and that's the way it's done in the world. And then Jesus says in verse 26, and this is what we pick up, Jesus says, it is not this way among you. Now, church, hear me. Jesus is making a, a comparison between the way it is in the world and the way it is in the kingdom. I was in the world for 15 years, served in the military, loved the military. The only thing that could have gotten me out of the military is what got me out is ministry. I love the, the military. I love everything about it. I love the, the, the command structure. I love knowing that I have a boss over me that tells me how to think concerning strategic plans. And he has someone over him that the commander in chief is the president of the United States. He's a civilian and the secretary of defense is a civilian. And they tell us in our military orders how to carry out the desires of our public. I love that. I love the fact that when I get my orders and I go into a room with my team and I say, this is what we have, we're going to do, I don't have to worry about them saying, I don't think we can do that. <laughs> when, when the order comes down and we're all marching, it's going out to the entire force, and I'm in the room with my people and I tell them what we're going to do, I don't have to worry about them saying, I'm not a part of that. I, I just, I just, I just don't, I don't, I, I don't see how we can do it. Uh, maybe you need to go back and ask them, do they mean that? <laughs> I love the military because when, when it comes down, this is what we're going to do. We're going to make it happen. And the and order's going to go down and down until everyone's got up and we're all going to march in step. I love that. And many of the businesses in the world, they're that way. But when I came to the church and to the kingdom of God, God says here in Matthew 20, <laughs> verse 26, it is not that way among you. And many of you have, have been dealing with me in, 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 in ministry, and you said to me, Pastor Hooker, it is not that way. I try to lead you the military way and tell you what we're going to do and ask you to hop to step and let's get with it. <laughs> Why are you hesitating? What's the problem? What's that look on your face? And you say, I'm not, I'm, I don't know if I want to do that. So I have to back up and I have to hear what the scripture says. And, and, and Jesus is talking to me about my leadership, about our leadership, about serving. And listen to what he says. It's not that way among you. But whoever wishes to become, a gr to become great among you shall be your servant. So, so in my leadership, I have to come from a servant mentality. I have to understand that, that in my leading I'm serving. That, 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 that I can get rid of the word leading and just say I'm serving you. I have to understand that my position is to serve. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Now listen to verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served. If you ever... If you're working in a Bible, paper Bible, underline that. If you, you can highlight it, because that's what we're going to be today. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, 
but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus came to rescue us. Jesus came to serve all of humanity by laying down his life. And this scripture says that Jesus did not come to be served. He did not need us to help him. What he had to do, he had to do. He, he, he didn't need us to endorse it. He didn't need our help to make it happen. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve you. Now hear me. That is important for us to understand because if we're gonna if we're gonna follow in Jesus' step, we need to understand what Jesus meant when he says he wasn't to be served. In Acts 17, we see this same concept as Paul is talking to the people of Athens about this unknown God. Now listen in Acts 17, verse 24 and 25, listen to how Paul describes to these intelligent cultural people about this God. How he defines to them he was unknown, but to Paul he was very well known. Paul knew this God, and I want you to pay attention in verse 24, how Paul described our God. 1724, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. God created everything. And the very temple you're trying to put him in, he can't live there because he created that too. And when, we, and when we try to make these homes, these houses, and try to minimize who God is, Paul is saying you can't do it. God does not live in houses made by man. He's bigger than we are. He created the earth and everything in it. That's the unknown God that Paul was expressing to them. Verse 25, and he is not served by human hands. This unknown God is not served. God is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. Church family, in our serving of God, you need to know you are not needed. God does not need you. He does not need me. We, you know, we are not, you know, I've heard us describe it this way because it helps. You know, we have to put things in words so we can understand. We say we are partnering with God. No, we're not partnering with God. Think about this. If we're partnering with God, God has given us every faculty that we have. Our ability to reason, to think, to use our hands, our feet, everything we have, our partner gave to us. So how are we going to help him when he gave us the ability to help him? What is it that, that I can add to him? What is it that I can do for him that God can't do for himself? He, he, I'm not his partner. So in my in, in, in understanding God, when he invites me to serve, it's not a partnership. It's, it's not that God, that I add anything to God when I serve him. Matter of fact, I want you to hear me today that, that God does not need you. God does not need us for anything. He is totally self-sufficient. He can do whatever he wants, when he wants. He is in need of nothing. Men may think God needs them, that God needs our lives, God needs our worship, God needs our offering, God needs our service, but God does not need us. He needs nothing that we have. Man cannot help or benefit God at all. For some of us, that's shocking to think. It means that all man is and has, himself and the world, are free gifts of God. Everything, 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 everything we have is a free gift of God. God has made man because God is loving and gracious and giving, not because he needs us. When God left heaven, 
He did not leave heaven because he needed us. He left heaven because he loves you. Be set free from that spirit that says you got to work and serve to get God's appreciation. That's a lie from the pit of hell. God is not interested in your work. He's not. And some of us type A people, some of us people who are more into the concrete work stuff because we can, we can calculate work. We can't calculate relationship. So we, so, we, so we sit back and we judge. And, and this is the problem that when I judge myself based upon how I serve, guess how I judge you? I judge you the same way. And God says, stop it. I don't need your service. When I ask you to serve, it's an invitation. It's an invitation. It's not because I am in need of you. God's not looking for partners in ministry. God is not looking for men and women to serve him. God did not create you to complete him. He did not create you to assist him. He created you to have a relationship with him. God gives you assignments. He gives me assignments in order to create opportunities. Listen, he gives us assignments. He gives us responsibilities to create opportunities for you to bond with him in new and deeper ways. Serving God is all about fostering communication between him and our souls. He gives you assignments in order to create opportunities. Serving God is all about fostering that relationship between your soul that needs him and a God that loves you. Our love for God becomes our source. Listen, your love for God becomes your source of motivation for doing the work, for doing the task that he has set before us. And once we are operating with this correct attitude about who God is and how he responds to us, it changes. It affects how we respond in doing our job. First Chronicles 29, 14, listen to what it says. But who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you and we give you only what you have first given us. In our serving, folks, we need to be broken. There, there's nothing, there's nothing, absolutely nothing for me to be proud about in my serving. I could, you know, I could, I could preach a series that's 365 days and the world would know about it. My name could be on CNN, ESPN. I mean, I would love to see my name on ESPN. But my name could be on all kinds of places. And people would say, man, it ain't me. I don't add anything to what God is doing. I'm just being invited in to be a part of what he's doing. So the first question, why does God invite us to serve him? The reason is because he wants a relationship. Plain and simple. He wants to do a relationship with you and me. Example. You're a parent and you have a three-year-old. And that three-year-old has a messy room. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I got a 23 Well, let me go ahead. <laughs> and that room is bad. And you look at your child and you say, man, I love my child. And I could go in and clean that room up in five or ten minutes and it'd be done. And I could move on and do other things. I own that room. Everything in that room is mine. The child is mine. So I just could go clean it up. But I don't do that. Why? Because I love my child. And I want to deposit something in my child that will benefit him in the long run. So I give up my time to go and sit down with my three-year-old and explain to them that their room is a mess. <laughs> that mommy and daddy, we do not like what smell is coming out of your room. And we, we need to do something about that. So you explain it to them, and now you take your three-year-old, and you go around, and you 
picking stuff up and he's staring at you, she's staring at you, they don't and they, they just watching you do it, and that's what happens the first time. You're doing everything and they just looking, and then the room is clean, and you sit down and say, See what we did? See how good it looks? And they say, Oh yeah, we just did we did. Thirty minutes, forty five minutes, an hour later, the room is clean. Was the goal to get the room clean? No. What was the goal? To deposit something in my son that will benefit him in our relationship and in their lives. God does the same thing with us when he asks us to serve with him. Now listen, sometimes God says, Hook, I want you to come serve with me. And I say, oh, good, 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 because there's something I want to do. God, I love doing that. Let's do that. That's called your gifting. When, when God asks you to do something in your gifting, you love to do it. Other people might look at it and say, man, I don't want to have nothing to do with that. But for you, it's fun. All of us have those things in serving that are fun, enjoyable, rewarding, because it comes from God. And he asks us to serve that way. But you know what? In developing that relationship with God, which is why he does it, Sometimes he asks you to do things that stink. He asks you to do things that you don't want to do. He asks you to go and deal with people that, that just, just burn you to even think about serving that person. There's something about that person, there's something about that responsibility that you don't want to do it, and you know what I'm talking about. And God says, I want you to do this. What is God doing? Is he concerned? Does he need you to do that? No. What is he doing? He's trying to deposit something. The second question, first question is, what is God, why does God ask us to join him in serving? What's his motivation? The second thing is, what is our motivation in serving? Once we understand what God is doing when he asks us to do something, no longer do I have a choice. Well, no, so let me take it back. You still have a choice. But you're not choosing not to do the thing. You're choosing not to respond to God's love. When God asks you to join him, when God asks you, say, I got something I need you to do. You're not doing it for him because he can do it himself. He can do it much faster. He can do it much better. But he's asking you because he wants to demonstrate his love. He wants to pour something into your soul. He wants to, he wants to connect with you on a deeper level. And you say, no, God, I don't want to do that. You are not saying no to the task. You're saying no to the one who died and gave himself for you. And every day, God comes to us and says, I, 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 Hook, I want, I, want to, I, want to, I, want to, I want to do something in you today. I want you, I want you to turn that television off. I want you to get up, and I want you to go serve somebody. Well, God, I'm busy. God, I don't want to do that. Listen, God, that's for somebody else to do. You see what happens when you don't understand why God is inviting you in to serve with him? You start making it about you. You start making it about the task. God doesn't need me to preach. God, God doesn't need this worship team. One of the problems we have, church, is we compare. When God asks us to do something, the first thing that comes out our, in our head is we compare, well, can I do it as good as somebody else? I mean, God, maybe you should ask them because they can do it better than me. Is God about doing the job better? Or is God about doing something in you? I think in the church today, and hear my heart, church, because when I say this, I know I'm going to ruffle some feathers. We've made a God out of excellence. That, that we want to do things in excellence, so if I don't sing as good as the excellent people, then I don't, you know, you don't have need of me. And that's not God. God is not, God is not about excellence. God is about relationship. And when, and when we make excellence the goal, hear me, there's nothing wrong with excellence except when you make it the goal. And I'm, and I'm telling people that I don't need them to serve because they don't do it excellent. Versus saying, man, God's trying to do something in their heart. And then I get to say, well, I don't do it as good. Why don't you ask somebody else to do it? If, if God was standing here and he said, I wanted a relationship with you, you wouldn't be saying, well, God, why don't you do it with them? You would say, God, I want you. 
Every time you're invited into service with him, view it as God saying, I want to spend time with you. I, I want to do something in your heart. So what's your motivation? What's my motivation in serving? Two responses we normally have. Is an obligation or it's a privilege? Is your serving an obligation? When God comes to you and gives you an invitation to join him, do you view it as an obligation? Well, I know uh, if, I don't, if I'm not at that door, nobody else is going to be there, so I guess I'll do it. Stop it. Well, Pastor TJ put me on that worship schedule, and, and I guess I got to do it since my name is on that worship schedule. Stop it. Well, I just don't feel like doing anything because I'm tired. Stop it. Jesus loves you enough to invite you into relation. The most important thing any of us will ever do is walk in relationship with God. And when he comes, we are so blind to his invitation. We're so blind to his invitation because of our myopic thinking that, that serving is about doing that we don't understand that God does not need your doing. God loves you enough to want a relationship with you. I was uh, sharing with the staff Friday on the difference between faith and works and how we view our works in relationship to our faith. And it's not the same thing, but it is the same thing. We judge ourselves by what we do and what we don't do. You know, because we, we can't see our relationship with God. We can't, no one else can see our relationship with God. So what we do is prove who we are by what we do and what we don't do. So our service is a, is a badge of honor. Our service is an indicator of where we are in the kingdom of God. And God says, stop it. Today, City Serve, there are going to be people in this room, you're going to have the opportunity to go to Hillcrest Nursing Facility. And you're going to have the opportunity to sit down with someone who might not be able to speak, who might not be able to hear anything you say, and you're going to be able, you're going to have the opportunity to serve them. What do you think God might be speaking to you about himself, about you in serving someone that can't serve themselves? Is it about calling out bingo numbers? Is it about helping them eat? Is it about putting tables together and wheelchairs? No, it's not about it. It's about God showing us that he has value in people who cannot perform based upon our measure. How many people have we thrown away because they could not perform? And God is saying, I want you to go to that place and I want you to instill value. People whose families have, have removed their value. He said, church, you be their family. And you instill value in them. It's not about the doing. God is trying to deposit something in our hearts about himself that God loves these people. And you have the privilege. I have the privilege. We have the opportunity to express the Father's heart to people who might not know it. We're going to a washerette, and we're going to pay for somebody's laundry. And you're just going to stand there and stick the card in and out, and $30 later, their laundry is going to be done. Is it about paying people's laundry? No. There's this mama that's going to come in there, a single parent that's got four or five kids, and every piece of clothing they've worn this week is in that bag. And she's wondering how she's going to pay for this laundry and pay her bills, and, and does anybody see the, the pain that she's in? And today, somebody's going to be in that laundry and say, God loves you, and he's heard you, and here's a little gift from God. And, and I just want to tell you, God is so happy with the love you're just expressing towards your kids. Is it about the money we're putting in that machine? No. It's about expressing. It's about receiving God's heart for this single parent that God loves. Just a few minutes, just, just a short amount of time, and we have no idea 
in the big scheme of things, how we watered and planted in that person's life on behalf of God. God don't need you. How many times have you served God? How many people have gone on mission trips to serve God, and when you came back and you said, God, I got more out of that than I gave? Come on, how many of you know what I'm talking about? It happens all the time when you understand why you're serving. Where's the team? Come. I close with two scriptures, two of my favorite scriptures. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself, what? A living, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. <laughs> Dead, God, however you want to use me. Have you ever seen a servant? Think about a servant that would come to serve you. They come to your house. You got a, 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 a sink full of dishes and, and kids' crumbs all under the table and, and the windows are filthy. And the servant, the servant comes in and says, listen, I'm not into the dishes today. I just got my nails done and I dish pan hands. I'm sorry. Is that a servant? Well, it won't be a servant for long. Because they're supposed to be there at your wish to do what you want them to do. Church, are we here to serve God and what he wants us to do? I'm excited about today. I'm excited about tomorrow. I'm excited about what God is doing as he enlarges our heart. I'm going to ask everyone to stand to your feet. And what I want us to do is all across the aisles, I want us to grab hands, stretch out. We're going to touch hands. We're going to pray for today and the great things that God wants to do. See, we realize, we realize now, because we realize what God wants to do, that God is not happy. Listen. God is not happy with our grumbling. God is not happy with our griping. To reject the task that he has put before us is to reject the opportunity to draw close to God. So, for those of you who are out in the foyer earlier complaining about how we assigned you, you can go ahead and repent. You can go ahead and say it now. <laughs> Pastor Hooker, I understand. I got it. I wish I would heard the message before I said what I said. But now I understand that I was griping and whining about an opportunity that God has given me. I want everybody today, whether you are a part of city service or not, that when we walk out of here today, we will, we, will, we will never reject an opportunity to draw close to God again. I don't care how minute, how minor it might be in our sight, or how much bigger than your ability might be. See, it works both sides. You can't cop out now and say, I can't do that because God has given you the ability to do it. And he wouldn't ask you to do it if he didn't want you to do it. And he wants the relationship more than he wants your ability. Father, we pray today, symbolized by our hands joined together. God, I'm believing this not just for Beverly Christian Center, but churches all over our city that we would serve today because we know your heart for our city. God, that we would serve today with, with abandon. That God, the love, the compassion that you have for hurting people would be seen, would be, would be, would be felt, would be acknowledged in the lives of people today. God, that we would, that we would, that we would serve God, with the power of God. Holy Spirit, use us today to do what we can't do on our own. And God, knowing that regardless of the results of what we do, God, what's important to you is the relationship that you're trying to build with us. God, I'm praying for relationships all across this room. People who haven't heard your voice in a long time, they're going to hear it today as they serve for you. People who've been crying out God, I need a touch from you. God, I, I need to know that I'm where you. God, today, as they are out serving, God, you're going to give them a touch. They're going to hear your voice, and they're going to say, yes, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for the incredible, wonderful, marvelous way you love us. In the matchless, holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody say amen.
Amen. Let's give the Lord a great big round of applause. Lord, we love you. 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 We love you, Lord. We love you and we thank you. We thank you for the incredible relationship that you've established with us. And God, I pray that not one person in this place would ever doubt, would ever doubt your love for them. In Jesus' name.